Gwen Eiffel talked with five New Hampshire Republicans and independents, all weighing their choices before Tuesday's primary. She sat down with them last night in a home in the town of Bedford. Thank you all for joining us. I'm so anxious to hear what you all have to say about these candidates who have taken over your state this week. Anna, I guess I'll start with you. What are you hearing so far that you like from these candidates, and what are you hearing that you still have questions about? I like the candidates that are talking about working together and trying to move things forward. I'm not hearing it from a lot of them. Uh, most of them are saying, you know, not Obama, not Obama, which I guess is one way to go. But I think that the best way for the government to move forward is to start working together and start accomplishing some things. So any candidate that is talking about that is uh, speaking to something that I think is important. Ted, thank you for having us in your home. Well, it's my pleasure. Welcome, welcome back to New Hampshire. Thank you. What are you hearing that you like that you don't and the, that you don't like? Some of the things that I like is the fact that I hear some, some of the candidates talking about solutions. And, you know, that's important to me. I mean, we're in a deep, we have some deep problems here in this country. And I'm more solution driven. I think that's real important. The thing that I'm really not really happy about is the way that they're attacking each other. It's okay to say, you know, here's our differences. But what I'm seeing and hearing is more vindictive kind of thing. And I, that's not what our country needs right now. Our country really needs solutions. Debbie, I hear, see you nodding as, as Ted says that. Absolutely. I, I think if we can't be civil, then we're not a civil society. And I see a lot of non-civility. I just don't like it at all. Who's guilty of it? They're all guilty of it. Um, you know, it's, I'm partisan, I'm bipartisan, I'm, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. I, I, I really, honestly, I don't care. I just want them to get the job done. Dennis, you're retired. You voted in, I won't say how old you are, but you voted in your share of elections. Yes, I have. Does this one sound different to you? Feel different? Well, I'd have to agree with Ted. I think this one uh, is uh, a little bit too negative, much negativism. And I think that that's really wrong for this country. We're, we're badly divided and, and too much fighting going on and, and not looking for solutions uh, that, that this country really needs to embrace. Uh, we're going the wrong way. And I, you know, I'm, I always tell my friends, you know, I'm the generation that's checking out, but I've got kids and grandkids that are inheriting this. And uh, I want it to be good for them. Josh, you're an Iraq war vet. You feel strongly that things have to change and there's got to be someone who's willing to talk tough to change it. Basically the biggest problem that I see with the gridlock that we've been in, I would say since uh, Congress changed hands, actually no, not even since that, I'd say since the beginning of the global war on terror, we've been doing one thing and we haven't come up with a way out, we haven't defined what it is that is going to satisfy uh, basically victory in the global war on terror. and. Until we define victory, until we develop a plan to achieve that victory, and then to end the war, soldiers are going to continue to die. And who do you think has got a plan? I think that Dr. Paul is the, is the first person, uh, it, the only person now that uh, Gary Johnson's out of the race. Uh, all of the other candidates are planning on continuing the global war on terror without any objectives. So let's get down to brass tacks. Which of these candidates is saying the things that you think you need to hear? I look at Romney as being a leader, somebody who has uh, stepped into situations that uh, weren't necessarily going the right direction. I think he has a, a great business experience, and right now we need to get the economy cranking and, and get some jobs going. So I think he's well capable of, of doing that. Uh, he's the right guy for this time. So, Ted, if the polls are to be believed, what Dennis is saying is what a lot of other New Hampshire folks are saying. What are you saying? I've, I've listened to Mitt. I've listened to them all. I've met, a I've, I've met many of them and I've talked to them face to face. The one that I'm moving towards is Newt. Um, I've heard him in the debates. I've talked to him. I've seen him here in New Hampshire. And what I see is a bright guy. He has solutions and he's brought up solutions and he's talked solutions. I will say, though, Gwen, that the thing that's concerned me the most is based on the Iowa caucuses and his reaction. That has concerned me a bit because... Which as, reaction? Well, he, he came across as being very angry and versus saying, you know what, I lost this in Iowa, you know, I'll get the next one. I'm really curious about that, Anna, because a lot of folks say that people in New Hampshire don't much pay attention to what happened in Iowa, but certainly Iowa tossed everything up into the air. Iowa doesn't influence the way I'm going to vote, personally. Um, when I look at the candidates, I look to see 
uh, whose social policies I'm comfortable with or depending on the range that's available who I can live with who seems uh, like they're most willing to come to the middle um, and then I go from there so in this field there's really only a few people who are moderate and they're h trying to hide it desperately uh, <laughs> naturally but um, so those are really the candidates that I'm bouncing between you've got less than a week on us oh I know and well, um, I mean, I've narrowed it down to two, if that's of any interest. So, oh, well, it's probably between Mitt and Huntsman. Josh, you had said earlier that you are very, uh, you worked last time for Ron Paul. You're supporting Ron Paul this time. How, why is he doing so much better? Why, in your opinion, is he getting so much more attention, so much more support, so much more money than he did four years ago? Well, simply the things that he was talking about four years ago have, they've manifested. I mean, he predicted the financial meltdown back in 2001 and warned about it for almost a decade before it happened. Uh, he warned about the consequences of the Iraq war, especially the long-term consequences, and now we're actually seeing those consequences, and that opens people's minds to the idea that this guy who did warn us might have the solutions. Debbie. So many Republicans I've talked to and independents have said this, they're animated this year by the desire to replace President Obama. How important is that to you? How disappointed or not disappointed are you by the current incumbent president? Well, I voted for him last time. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm very disappointed in what hasn't happened. There were so many things that were promised, so many things that he said we were going to get or that were going to change or that were going to happen. Um, and whether it's because of what he walked into or whether it's Congress or lack of leadership, I'm not sure, but I'm very disappointed with that. So that means among the people who are running to replace him, you're leaning toward? I'm actually leaning very strongly towards um, Mr. Huntsman because of his talk and his conversation about education and economy and how they intersect and how important those two things are. They have to be together. Mr. Romney's a very nice man. I've met him. But somebody asked him in one of the town hall meetings about um, how middle America was going to get back to, to having a life. And he said, yeah, you know, I'm really worried about my investments too. Hello? Mm -hmm. Middle America doesn't have any investments anymore. We, we don't have that benefit that we used to have. Is anybody listening anew to Rick Santorum, who was a, who's been running here a lot, but hadn't really done well until Iowa, Ted? Yeah, I actually, uh, Rick was my second between, uh, between um, Newt and uh, Rick. Uh, what I like about Rick is his stands and his principles and his values. Uh, I spoke to him on several occasions and had a very good feel does this election need, or does the next president need to be an outsider, an insider, or someone who has a little bit of outside, inside cred? I would say outside, inside cred. I mean, I think that Washington is an institution, and if you don't have any experience, then you're going to spend part of it, part of your time there, your short time there, just figuring out the lay of the land and how it works. Uh, but if you have someone who's too entrenched, in the way things are working, uh, then they're not working right now. So that's got to hurt you. I think one of the things besides the inside out is we need a collaborator. You know, the president, you know, sets the tone. It's a top-down kind of thing, and I expect the president to be a collaborator. Josh? I only want the Congress to work together when they're actually working towards something that I think will help the country. I, I don't want them to collaborate on spending money that I haven't earned yet. So collaboration is overrated. Collaboration, it has, to be for, it has to be for a purpose that actually benefits the American people. And I think, I think really, whether you collaborate or you don't collaborate, if you aren't in touch with the American public, you can collaborate all you want, but it's not going to benefit us. Well, uh, as you all approach primary day, for those of you who've made up your minds, I wish your candidates good luck. And for those of you still deciding, I wish you good luck. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The people in Gwen's discussion were selected with the help of civic and educational organizations in New Hampshire. And for the record, none of the voters mentioned Texas Governor Rick Perry in that conversation. As we said earlier, he is headed to New Hampshire this evening. And now for more on the campaign, Margaret Warner talks with Gwen. 
And hi, Gwen. Uh, you have a fascinating discussion. You're quite a veteran of New Hampshire primaries. What struck you about those voters as compared to, say, voters in Republican primaries past? Well, I was interested in the, the degree to which they really were not talking about the candidates as much as they were talking about what it is the candidates have to say. Now, four years ago when we were here in New Hampshire, Margaret, we were had two primaries going on, the Democrats and the Republicans. So it was a lot more going on, a lot more conversation, even a lot more television advertising. Right now, because it's a Republican primary in which undeclared voters can participate, people are thinking very carefully about what these candidates have to say. There's a reason why Rick Perry's name didn't come up. He's at 1 percent in the latest polls. He hasn't been really campaigning in New Hampshire. On the other hand, someone like John Huntsman, who has been campaigning here, is only at 8 percent in the polls. So people are making, at least they seem to me, the people in that room last night and voters I talked to along the way seem to be making their decisions based on a series of principles rather than just whoever has put on the last television ad. And that's uniquely New Hampshire. Well, this is always a famously volatile final week in the New Hampshire primary. Is there much movement uh, among, say, at the top rung of candidates? I mean, is Romney suffering from these attacks? Is Santorum getting any kind of bounce or second look after Iowa? You know, this is one of these things where you take the numbers that you see and you put it up against what your eyes see. What my eyes have been able to see is that people are taking a second look at Santorum. But when you look at the numbers, the latest at WMUR, which is the ABC affiliate here in New Hampshire, th their latest poll out this evening shows Romney still out way ahead with like 44 percent of the vote, followed by Ron Paul with less than half of that at 20 percent. And then there's this weird little fight for third place among John Huntsman, Newt Gingrich, and Rick Santorum, each of them with 7 or 8 percent. So when you look at the numbers, n not much has changed. The question I find compelling about this primary is not so much who's ahead and who's behind, but what it is everyone's talking about. What's moving these voters to either stick with their candidate or consider and decide later on. Now, how is Rick Santorum's, at least the socially conservative part of his message, playing in New Hampshire, which, as we know, does not have the kind of evangelical voter base that Iowa does? Well, exactly, Margaret. Not only is New Hampshire considered to be the home of far more moderate Republicans, as well as undeclared candidates who can vote in the Republican primary, but also they're not a big church-going population here in New Hampshire. So someone like Rick Santorum comes in, and he was people were listening to him. But then late yesterday, he went to speak at a college, a group of college students, and. Uh, organization in Concord, New Hampshire, and he started talking about gay marriage, and he compared it to polygamy, and he got booed off the stage. Then this afternoon, a whole lot of other protesters, including Occupy Movement people, as well as gay marriage proponents, started showing up at events and, and, and heckling him again. His response, probably not very judiciously, was, well, people in New this is like most people in New Hampshire. That's what they do. That's not exactly how you win over <laughs> New Hampshire people. Well, Gwen, that's fascinating reporting. We'll be looking forward to it uh, in the next coming days. Thanks. Thanks, Margaret.